From anatomy to anesthesiology, from pathology to pharmacology, from microbiology to medicine, a one-man resource to the world of health sciences. Welcome to Dr. Paul's Medical Lectures. A practicing physician, Dr. Paul offers you essential insights on diseases afflicting millions of people around the world. For today's lecture, here is Dr. Paul. Okay, folks, this is Dr. Paul. Thanks very much for tuning to our channel this evening. I want to talk a few minutes about fibular fractures. Basically, fibular fractures are very, very common. And in fact, I saw one patient this morning, that's why I want to talk about it. They commonly happen due to minor trauma. And many times, you have to deal with them in the primary care centers. And as a primary care center, I take care of them many times. And fibular fractures in adults are typically due to trauma and isolated fibular fractures. And in, ma in majority of cases, they happen in older women. Fibular fractures may also occur at the other areas due to, I mean, repetitive trauma. And we call them as stress fractures. And uh, they happen with all kinds of injuries. But in older adults, the key risk factor for the fractures of the fibula or tibial shaft appears to be the bone mass. You see, if there is less bone mass, they are more at risk for these fractures. So the bone mass, what is the bone mass of this particular individual? We need to think about that always. The other factor is cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking is an important risk factor for fibular fractures. So it's important to advise these people to stop smoking. The other group who, who sustain these fractures are athletes when they are uh, when they go into contact or collision sports. When that uh, stress falls upon the fibula, the fibula gets fractured. So those are the most important uh, groups. You remember that whenever uh, most of the patients I see, they come from the ground. They are sports injuries especially American football or soccer or rugby, they are especially prone to these injuries because they put a lot of stress on that particular joint. And snowboarding and skiing. And snowboarding and skiing are very, very, I mean, fibular fractures are very, very common. And uh, in skiing, it is mostly the proximal third of the tibia and also the fibula. Whereas in snowboarding, snowboarding, you see, more more often they sustain a fracture of isolated fibula because in the snowboarding the uh, stress falls upon the distal third of the fibula and they sustain the fracture. So you see how many different factors are influencing these fractures. It could be a bone mass in an older patient, it could be a stress fracture due to repetitive trauma or it could be a sports injury that happens in sports like skiing or uh, snowboarding or uh, American football, soccer or rugby. So remember these ideological factors because they help you to think about this. So many times they go through neurovascular bundle injuries beside bone fracture. I mean they could injure the ligaments and uh, they could injure the nails. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. And many times the fibula and tibia, they broke together. When that happens, that we call it double fracture. A double fracture happens when both tibia and fibula are fractured. Simple, common sense, because there are two fractures here. Now, an important point I need to mention here about common peroneal now. You see, when there is the fibula around its neck, we see common peroneal now, I mean proximal fibular neck. So common fibular now, it wraps around fibula and it goes into the superficial space. So when the common fibula now is injured, the patient develop that foot drop and other neurological sensitive abnormalities. So remember, common peroneal now could be injured in a fracture of a fibula, especially in the proximal third. Non twisting fall. When the uh, ankle twists inside, sometimes that powerful stress acts upon the lateral part of the 
leg and it could result in a fracture. So you see the mechanisms, the inversion injuries and uh, also the stress fractures. So the, there, is, there are varied mechanisms for this fracture. Now, symptoms and signs. Many times you see a deformity. That's the most important clinical sign. A deformity. When you examine the bone, you see shortening or angulation. And uh, examine the skin also. Many times you see a laceration or a contusion. Sometimes open fractures happen, which is an indication for emergency orthopedic evaluation. And also, open fractures are more prone to injuries and infections. And see for peroneal nerve injury, see for uh, uh, even ligamental injury. The other thing, important point I want to mention here is uh, lateral compartment syndrome. Many times, lateral compartment syndrome happens, patient presents with uh, intense pain in this area. And there is intense pain, severe pain. Um, always think about lateral compartment syndrome, folks. Now, what about uh, diagnosis? Basic diagnostic aid is X-ray. And if you think of soft tissue injury, think of uh, you can order an MRI because MRI help to define the soft tissue damage, especially in the crush injuries. So you can order an MRI when there is a crush injury and you want to know how much soft tissue damage has happened. And in those cases, you need to refer these patients to orthopedics. So open fractures and uh, fractures of the fibula, and uh, they are highly likely to be infected. In those cases, you need to start antibiotics for these patients. So lateral compartment syndrome, common peroneal nerve injury, these are the two things you need to always suspect in fibular fractures, folks. And if you see them, you need to send these people to orthopedic evaluation. Another thing, there is a mesonail, that is proximal neck fracture, mesonail fracture. So, so remember that that's a fancy word. So that is mesonail fracture. Now, how do you treat these people? Very simple. For most fibular injuries, immobilization is all that is needed. Immobilization with a molded stirrup splint uh, made up of plaster paris or fiberglass, it doesn't matter because all you need to do is to initial immobilization. So you use a stirrup splint and you immobilize them and then you bring them back to the clinic after two or three days. So first initially immobilize them, then bring them back to the clinic and then examine them again. And then the definitive treatment is to use either a walking cast or a short cast. So you can use, nowadays they, they are making walking boots which are very very convenient and many people ask for them. So you can use walking cast boots or you can just simply cast them. So those are the most important things you need to do in the treatment. But if you see an open fracture, especially a crush injury, then you should not treat them by yourself. You should always ask your help from an orthopedic surgeon. So short leg cast is used if the patient is not comfortable ambulating. For example, you can give them crutches, but you see, fibula is a non-weight-bearing bone. I mean, the, the weight falls upon tibia, not the fibula. You can give them crutches to make them more comfortable. But ultimately, what the bone needs here is immobilization. How can you provide it? A splint or a cast? So a splint or a cast, folks, that's very important. So fibula is a non-weight bearing bone. So fractures many times can be managed by immobilization non-operatively. That's an important point you need to remember. 
and if you could avoid those varus and valgus stress fa uh, forces that make the immobilization difficult, then you should always cast them. A short leg cast will always help these people. So, those are the most important uh, points I wanted to stress this uh, evening about uh, fibular fractures. And remember, if the proximal fibular fracture happens, we call it mesonal fracture. And uh, fractures involving both the fibula and tibia are they are they also need they, they need orthopedic evaluation. Severe crush injuries or badly displaced fractures and a neurovascular deficits or lateral compartment syndrome then you don't just catch them and send them home. They need orthopedic evaluation. But if they are simple, you can do analgesic exercise, elevation and all that stuff and then you can catch them or you can use a splint. That's the basic management. And the good thing about it is 90% of times those basic steps would all that is needed to heal these fractures. Immobilization using a splint. I treated like uh, hundreds of them, immobilization using a splint. And very rarely when I see the complications do I send them for orthopedic evaluation. So that's about uh, fibular fracture. Now let me show you an x-ray. And the x-ray, I mean, this is an x-ray I recently saw. And it has very important uh, uh, elements to it. You can see here this x-ray and uh, you are seeing uh, tibia and fibula. I am showing you the distal tibia and fibula and uh, you can see there like uh, let me show you that fibula the distal part is especially you can I mean this is the AP view but let us uh, take this view the second view you can see that clear fracture folks you see that clear the fracture is like the piece you can see those pieces very clearly here uh, the disc this is the distal fibula fracture I mean the tibia is fine you see the tibia is not this is an older woman and as I told you earlier the older woman they are particular uh, at risk for to sustain these uh, uh, fibular fractures like I mean isolated fibular fractures now this is a lateral view I mean in the lateral view you can also see that crack you see in the lateral view but in the AP view it is much better as I have shown earlier so you can see the other bones like a talus calcaneus navicular and uh, you can see the metatarsals you can see the tibia and um, but all of them are fine so you see you, you need to say but uh, characteristically the other fracture is very very nicely shown so this is a fracture uh, and I treated this patient with a nice splint and uh, let us see how it goes thank you very much thanks for listening for more medical videos, please visit us at www.drpaul.org and take time to browse through hundreds of health videos we regularly post on our site. If you are preparing for USMLE, PLAB, and other medical exams, make sure you visit our website to browse through our videos explaining the essential points you need to know before taking these examinations. For more information, visit us at www.drpaul.org. Thank you and may God richly bless you.